Today, I'm speaking with South African cattleman Clive Biggs. Clive is a second generation operator of the Nandi and Goonie stud in eastern South Africa. Nandi and Goonies has the reputation as one of the highest quality and Goonie breeding operations in the world. And in October, Clive recently sold one of his bulls for a world record price uh, for an, an Nguni bull. Regular, regular listeners will know that I see regenerative farming as a key piece to the optimal human health puzzle by creating an abundant future of nutrient dense food while simultaneously regenerating depleted land and making use of land that is unfit for cropping. The tribal African Nguni cow seems to be the best breed for this purpose as its natural characteristics and lack of human breeding interventionism make it incredibly robust, incredibly fertile, incredibly fit for purpose and requiring minimal if no chemical input. You might hear my enthusiasm in this interview because I'm truly astounded at the natural attributes of Clive's animals, uh, even out of the Nguni animals that I have heard and the previous guests that I've had on this subject. So I think a vision that we can collectively strive for is a food system that meets and provides uh, abundant access to red meat, uh, particularly animal fat and and grass-fed animal meat, Um, and having uh, thousands of smaller scale operations, perhaps raising in Guni or other types of cattle in a fully grass fed uh, way is is the way forward. I hope you enjoy this podcast with Clive. And if you're a farmer or interested in running in Guni, then contact me via email or social media, and I can put you in touch with someone. Now onto the podcast. <music> Clive, tell us, tell us about your story in terms of your Nguni farming and how did you arrive at where you are at the moment and yeah, give us all the background. Okay, so basically um, my dad's the one that started our Nguni stud um, and he sort of used to trade him and his brother with cattle. And um, so at that stage, they were sort of buying in cattle from, you know, different areas, different types of cattle. And what they noticed when they bought some Nguni heifers from Zululand, how well they actually adapted um, to the farm with no sort of interference. Uh, They picked up condition, um, you know, and it was sort of an easy maintenance animal. There wasn't, um, you know, a lot of work to go into them. So... Then they noticed when the chaps came to buy cattle, a lot of them were buying the colorful cattle. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why my dad actually started with Nguni was um, he just realized how easy they were to farm. So then he went to Zululand and they purchased bulls and some females um, and that's how they started. And they started in 1977. Yeah, quite a long time ago. And yes. where, where t- tell us where exactly you are in South Africa, and because um, I think it's interesting when we talk about the, yeah. the re- resilience of the breed and and its characteristics. Okay, where we are at the moment um, is a place called Cedarville. It's on the border of the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal, and we're also close to uh, Lesotho. So where we live, um, it's very mountainous and rough ground. So our ground sort of runs from about 1,600 meters up to 2,100 meters. So we get very harsh um, winters, you know, with snowfall. So we have hot summers with um, tick-borne diseases and, you know, the cold winters. And, um, you know, the Ngunis utilize all the ground. They go a rot up into the steep sections. Um, you know, they, the animals that can walk easily. So uh, we're very, um, fortunate to have a breed like that where we farm. So, so your dad got into the farming in, in, as you mentioned in in the late 1970s and he, he started building his herd and it sounds like he tried a a bunch of cattle breeds, um, of different types. And I chatted to Ed Schroeder about this and he was telling me how for, for a long period, the South African government was promoting the British breeds and it was almost seen as um, something that people were trying to encourage these 
these uh, uh, British type breeds. But um, what what your dad found, and, and I think what a lot of farmers found, was it's actually the indigenous cattle that were the best kind of suited to to the environment. So, so h- how did you get involved? I guess having the operation been started by your dad. You know, well, we've grown up with the cattle, um, so you know that's where our passion. I mean, it's come from. I was um, basically when I was born, he started with them, and. Um, you know, it's just over the years working with them, they're such a, a easy breed to farm. Um, we don't have people when it's calving season, we don't um, have problems with calving. So our cattle calve out in the camp. So we basically, um, they run like wild game, basically. It's just um, with the stud, we just tag them and um, do the recording of births, etc. So... But but besides that, the cattle look after themselves. In fact, they look after us. You know, that's that's as simple as that. It's amazing. And I I, I talked to Jake Wolke, uh, one of the regenerative farmers here in in Australia, about this idea of, of, of an apocalypse cow. And if there was a complete breakdown in um, modern veterinary care and modern kind of uh, an agricultural system, you would still have this Nguni cow completely um able to be um pr- pr- thriving despite the absence yeah. of human interventionism and it sounds exactly what what your your herd is yes no, well if you think about it i mean you know thousands of years ago they the cattle that moved down the coasts and that with all the challenges and they made it so um you know in those days there was no medicines and stuff like it's all natural um selection and hardiness and you know, that is what's made this breed. And, you know, I always say, you know, we mustn't try and change a breed. Um, Just keep them natural, let them, and we can just um, help out selecting the more fertile, the ones with the good milk and um, sort of, you know, but with minimum interference, you know, we don't want to change this breed. They, to me, it's the perfect breed. And and let's talk about these these characteristics. So you you mentioned that you don't need to help them with calving. And for the non agricultural listeners to to the podcast, um, th- this is a pretty important thing because if the the cattle are having babies and the the labor is obstructed in in, in obstetrics, um, we, we we call that um, obstructed labor, and you need to intervene by by uh. Um, all kinds of instrumentation and in, in, in human medicine, the the worst case scenario is you need to do a cesarean section. But t- tell us about the, the the importance of this e- easy calving um, as it relates to to your to raising cattle. You know, the thing what we uh, found is like an, a lot of other breeders will bring their cows um, in close to the house um, in small camps, and they feeding those cows because. Um, you know, there's obviously not enough food in the winters, so they're feeding them just to keep an eye on their calving. They've got, um, you know, basically the, the workers are checking them twice, three times a day to see if there are any issues. Where our cattle, we don't need to do that. They just do it on their own up in the camps with um, no interference. You might get one case where a calf's turned or something, but... Um, you know, then we'll help it. But um, sort of most of the time, you don't need to help them at all. All we do is we just go and count our calves out in the camps and um, just admire, you know, every calf is like a lucky package. You never know what you're going to get with the color patterns and that. So it's an exciting um, time for us when they're calving. Yeah, and a lot of my listeners have also read Western Price, and and I would really recommend anyone who hasn't to read the work of Western Price. And he was a basically an anthropologist who visited uh, remote communities all around the world in the 1930s and observed their health um, and and their habits. And he talked about an Inuit community where the women simply go out into the bush and they come back with with their baby. <laughs> and and obviously, what we're talking about is just natural birth. Um, and yeah. it sounds like the Nguni are the, the complete um, equivalent of that. Whereas, you know, I've heard um, one um, Hereford, uh, Her- Hereford operation one year, and not to pick on Hereford, uh, to, not, not to cast aspersions, but they had something like a 40% pull rate, meaning that 40% of their cows had to be like, pulled out of, uh, out of the, the birth canal. 
Um, so to 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 say that you, the Ingunis don't need any of that completely, um, that's that's pretty remarkable in my mind. You know, and the thing is with the Nguni, it's um, <clears throat> obviously with um, thousands of years of um, natural selection, even if you use British bulls on them, those cows determine the calf size and they'll still give birth without assistance. Um, so, you know, that's why a lot of people don't realize um, how super cow the Nguni is. You know, it's only basically when you've been d working with them and you've had other cattle that you realize how easy um you know there's just it's it's a, such a pleasure to farm with them do you have lions and other predators that um that prey no, on no not where i live we have jackal uh, lynx and um you know so not we don't have lions and that but um our ingunis have horns, so and we've seen it. Um, you know, you'll get a cow when she's just dropped her calf. The uh, jackals are mainly after the afterbirth, um, but those cows keep them away. So I've had an experience where my dad and I came across one up in the mountain, and um, there were three jackals trying to get to her afterbirth, and she was just um, kept spinning around the calf, you know, protecting it, and we watched it for a while, and um, they didn't get anywhere near that calf. <laughs> do do they eat the placent their placentas? Yes, they do. But you see, what happened was this one had just given birth, so um, the jackals were they were there, and she they just couldn't get it from her. You know, she kept she was protecting the calf more than anything. But um, yeah, so eventually the jackals we went there and they'd gone, and then yeah, they do they eat it up. So as soon as, and that's one thing about Nguni, they calf quickly. So when that calf drops, that cow's on her feet quickly and the calf will be on his feet quickly. And while she's eating the placenta, that calf's drinking already. they super quick. Yeah, and, and uh, they'll, uh, I've heard stories of, of uh, breeders who are using Nguni uh, calves or who bred in Goonie calves compared to their other breeds and the other breeds are kind of doughy you know the the calves like yes. oh you know where am, where am I uh, just landed into this mortal realm and the Goonie calves already um you know dodging jumping up and, and difficult to catch um yeah. and, and it makes sense because the, the selection pressure of of um predators um was 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 at a degree that didn't exist um probably yeah. for those those other breeds you know, and within hours, that calf's actually running next to its mother. It's not even, you know, just walking. It's like a, if you look at like a blessed buck when they um, have their little one, it's quick and that's, well, any antelope and it's on its feet and it's running right next to its mother. And then goonies do exactly the same thing. Wow. The, um, the, the color pattern is a, is a very interesting feature of the the Nguni cattle and it's one that uh, i think the the commodity market is kind of trying to squeeze out of of cattle breeding and for for the listener um if if you've gone and eaten McDonald's Angus beef or you know you've gone to a restaurant and it's Angus beef um basically that's a black animal and it's a black angus and it seems like the the commodity market in the Australia and and i believe in in um South Africa too Clive is basically prizes the animal because it's black um and and this is just like a, a a phenomenon of the market and it doesn't necessarily reflect the the quality of the meat or all these other characteristics that we're we're talking about so what's your take on on coloring and maybe you could explain to the listener um the inguni coloring um patterns you know that in my opinion the color patterns is another thing that makes it so unique um you know not every animal looks the same and what's you know we also have a, a theft problem in our country with cattle um theft and they reluctant to take a nguni because it's got a specific color pattern and if you've got photos of your cattle and that you can identify your animal because not you know, every Nguni is different. Um, so where with other cattle, if they all look the same, um, you know, it's difficult to prove it's your animal if they've changed or tampered on the brands, etc. 
But, um, you know, when it comes to the meat and that um, Nguni meat is its first prize. It's um, healthy meat. It's got the yellow fat, you know, from the grass fed. And um, it's just a, it's a healthy um, quality meat. And um, those, you know, the thing that makes the Nguni, um, I think, um, sort of better than other breeds, in my opinion, is um, the way they sort of run. Most farmers run them out extensively. It's not, um, you know, cooped up in little camps where they're being fed um, sort of unnatural food. Yeah, and uh, that's it. I never thought about it that way in terms of theft deterrence. It's almost like each Nguni has a fingerprint um, that's, that's does, visible. Yeah. <laughs> yes. that, that's visible by anyone. And um, you can't forge, whereas if you had a block colored cow, you know, anyone who's a thief could, as you say, tamper with the, the, the branding to, to, yes. uh, to obscure that, the ownership, but you can't, uh, you, you can't fake the, uh, very, very unique, um, color patterns. The Ed Schroeder mentioned that, that, that had a, there's a very, um, deeply entire cultural link to the Zulu tribes yes. who have all kinds of interesting names for those color yeah. patterns. Yeah, no, there's a lot of different names. And, um, you know, the even with their sort of um, ceremony, some of them, they want specific colors for, um, you know, whatever they, um, you know, that family's having. Like if they're celebrating something, they're looking for a specific animal. So that's where the Nguni also, you know, it's, it's in their um, culture. And, um, you know, that's one of the fortunate things, yeah, where we farm is there's always a market for, um, especially in Guni females. Um, you know, they've got a thing called labola when they get married. Um, the future husband's got to give the father-in-law cattle and they want in Gunis. It's just in their culture. So, you know, there's always, you can ask a premium price and they'll always go quickly. Um, the only problem we do have in this country is with the oxen. Um, you know, with the young oxen, it's not, once they sort of get to about 300 kilos, there's no discrimination. But there is a discrimination against the Nguni um, as a weaner, um, purely because when they go into a feedlot, they fatten quickly um, because they, you know, an animal that's... Um, you know, it's it's used to tough conditions. So when you put it in a, a easy environment, it just fattens up quickly. So you know, some of them will discriminate. They say it puts on too much fat, um, and then hasn't reached the, the basically the carcass size that they're wanting. But um, I don't see it as a problem. To me, the quicker you can move those cattle out, and they've got enough fat on them, and it's healthy meat. Um, I think it's a bonus. Yes, and and for the listener, the oxen is a, essentially a steer, a, a neutered, yes. um, a, a neutered male calf, that and and they being used for working or what, what? What are the what are the uses other than meat for oxen? You know, they, they they're still using them in um you know areas for plowing. They plow with them. Um, they pull you know fetch water. Um, they use ox you know little scotch carts. They um put out um, the gather wood so you'll find in a lot of the urban areas ach, the rural areas they've got um, it's like trails where you can see where they're dragging a lot of wood to their houses for cooking etc so um, you know the oxen it's it's part of their culture as I said then good yeah and um, can you can you talk about fertility and and that's a, I guess a bit of an ex- extension of this idea of them, uh, uh, the Nguni cow is an amazing creature of, of reproduction, and and you've you've told us how easily they they carve, and you don't they don't need pulling, um. But but talk to us about the the actual um fertility and like ha- how many cows, how many calves are each of these cows having in a lifetime? You know, it all depends on your area too. Sort of on the sweeter felts, um, you know where bulls run in. They don't um they've got no like basic calving season the bull runs in with the cows all year round um i mean there are farmers that i've heard of a cow 22 years old and she's had 20 calves um you know you often get 18 year old that's had 17 calves 
So they're carving sort of um, in those areas at the age of 18 months to 20 months, their first calf. And then, you know, they every basically year they have a calf, um, some of them even less than a year. So that's why you'll get a cow with 18 years old and had 17 calves. Their fertility, they super fertile. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, to me, it's um, probably the most fertile breed that you can get. Yeah, and and it's hard to think that this isn't anything other than uh, you know nature's uh, you, um, kind of. You you, you mentioned uh, like you go out and they have a cow and you come back. It's like a money printer where they they all you do is you give them grass and you uh, uh, and they and they just reproduce. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, you know, the Ngunis, um, like I said, if you look what you put in and what you get out, there's no breed um, that can compare that. You know, a lot of the guys, um, they force they, to get calves every year and to get their sort of um, big calves and that they, they're putting a lot of money into their cows to get that. Where with the Nguni, um, it's low input um and they and they those cows are weaning over fifty percent of their weight naturally. So um, you know a lot of people will measure. Um, they always talk about the weight of their weaner instead of um, saying you know sort of the beef produced per hectare like they would in um, maize or um, you know they'd say uh, tons per hectare. So if you do it in that sense, there's no breed that will beat the Nguni um, kgs of beef produced per hectare. Nothing, you know. It's... And, and and that's a really important um, point when we're talking about this kind of wide, wider narrative about beef consumption in society. And they're essentially beef consumption of beef agriculture is under attack as far as i'm concerned um by with a with by a range of of interests most of them lying in corporate um industrial monocropping um industries that uh, are profiting massively from a high chemical input um business model but um i think what you've described clive is such a great uh rebuttal in many ways when when we're thinking about what cow to use which is if we're going to use one that is a really high feed efficiency and is able to, um, we're able to raise more beef per per hectare, then that's going to that's a massive advantage and a massive, um, I, I guess, pro in in favour of highly efficient beef consumption. Do, do can you talk a little bit now about um, the the fact or, or what they're able to eat. And I guess that goes into feed efficiency because um, I, I, I've talked to on previous podcasts about the, the fact that these are, these animals are not only grazing, but they're actually browsing as well. Yes. And I, I think that's relevant, um, especially I've talked about Nguni as a potential animal for a lot of marginal country here in Australia. Um, the fact that they can eat food that is not um, palatable to other breeds. So, so maybe tell us, talk, talk to that a little bit. You know, with the Nguni, they, um, they graze and browse, like you just said, um, which, and they definitely browse a lot more than other breeds um, of cattle. And with the Nguni, they sort of, they have a higher um, urea level in them. So they, um, you know, some farmers are using sort of urea-based licks to get their cows to eat harder grasses. So it's um, exactly what the Nguni has. It, it, does it naturally um eating so our farms are sort of mixed sour felt and um we've actually eaten the sour felt virtually out because the ingunis utilized all of it and the sweeter grass has spread and um it's actually improved our farm over the years um you know and a lot of people that i actually had a chap yesterday visiting me um to come and view our grass species and that and he was, um, he just said, you know, it's phenomenal how well these um, cattle have uh, utilized all the grass. Um, when you look across the sort of boundary fences on other cattle, you'll see a lot of hard grasses. And it's just purely on um, that simple reason that they don't graze it like the Nguni does. Um, and in the sweet felt, you know, the ingunis, you'll see them, you know, eating out of the trees a lot. Um, 
we other cattle you won't see it. It, it, I'm, I'm, it's incredible hearing you describe this because it makes me so excited. And I think that <clears throat> not many people are actually understanding the implications of what you've just said um, for agriculture and for the, the world because so many problems that we have agriculturally are the loss of grazing land, desertification, um, poor quality grazing, overuse. And what you're just describing is that the Nguni is has the potential to be able to essentially regenerate the, the these landscapes, but by the fact that it grazes so non-selectively and therefore is allowing um, all, all these more favourable grasses that perhaps other cattle are then able to eat um, to, to to come back. So I'm 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 actually blown away. I think it's it's so important that um, what what you what you what you're telling us right now. You know, in, in some other areas, um, there's sort of what we call the Karoo felt. Um, it's very sensitive areas, you know, it's dry areas. And um, when you travel um, sort of the Northern Cape, um, those areas, you'll see, you you won't see many other breeds besides Ingunis um, and sheep. And basically the reason for that is the Ingunis, um, they, they can walk long distances um, to water. So in the Karoo, you'll get an area, big camps, and the water is very sparse. And other breeds just, you know, they, they'll lie around the water troughs and um, overgraze around the water troughs. Where the Nguni won't, it'll go out and they'll go graze a wide area and then come back for water and carry on, you know. So um, I know in some areas where they said the sheep had actually, they were damaging the felt from overgrazing. Some farmers have, um, you know, brought in ingunis and got rid of their sheep and they actually shocked in to see how the felt is recovering. Yeah, it's 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 huge. I think um, that when more people understand this technology, it's it's Mother Nature has created or shaped this te technology over whatever to ten thousand plus years, um, and now we've got this perfectly adapted uh, natural way of converting completely inedible um, plant matter into um, highly efficient um, source of, of of human food um, and and a tool to to regenerate our landscape. So. Yeah, it's 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 I'm <laughs> I'm very much uh, excited, Clive. I think it's it's incredible um, what what you're describing, the the um the temperament of the the animal. So uh, this is this is relevant, I think, for uh, more of the the farmers in the audience because you don't want a cow that um, is going to be aggressive or difficult to handle from from a um, livestock point of view. So t talk to us about the temperament of the Nguni. You know, the Nguni, I think it's um, because for thousands of years they, they've actually lived with the people. You know, they crawl them, their crawls are right on their houses. So I always um, say Nguni is a people's cattle because it loves people. They're very inquisitive. When, um, you know, you get visitors come visit us on the farm, they can't believe how the cows will all come to you and stand around you and... Um, you know, they, they're inquisitive and um, they just love people. Like um, the only pr thing you do have is cows when they've just dropped their calf. Um, some of them are very protective over their calf. So they, for about a week, some of them, they, they won't let you close to that calf. But that's just natural instinct. It's not a temperament issue. It's a protective issue. Um, now... After about a week or two, those cows, they once they calf's big and strong and they feel it's not under threat, then that all goes away and they'll, you know, become tame again. So, um, but there's no animal they, they, you know, if you come to, if anyone comes to our farm, they're always amazed on how tame the cattle are. But in saying that, you do get some wild animals like in any breed and we cull them, you know, we get um, rid of them. So our herd, basically, um, we don't have a temperament issue at all. Yeah, and uh, it's a great segue into talking about the, the, bull, the bulls particularly 
um, I, I was I can't remember who exactly I was talking to who was describing their use of another I believe it was a, another Sangha cattle breed maybe it was a uh, or it could have been Brahmin um, it could have been a Brahmin bull and essentially that when they put the bull in in the paddock with the Nguni um, cows it, the, the thing kind of got tired after about servicing maybe 20 20 cows and, and it couldn't keep up with with the rest yeah. of the cows so to talk to us about your, your bulls and maybe um we'll talk a bit later about those specific bulls but in in general what what is the nguni bull like well you know the that's one point where like the farmers always talk about the nguni being this um super mother line but i always say it, it's not just a super mother line it's a the whole breed as a whole is it's just a super breed. Um, there's no other breed bulls that can cover as many cows as Nguni bull. And, um, you know, the reason for that is, is the Nguni bull isn't the heaviest bull, but they are fit, fit, fit um, bulls. And, you know, like we've got in our stud, um, we run 90 cows to one bull, and that's in a three-month um, season. And then we're getting 87 calves. Um, you know, out of one bull, 85 calves. So, you know, it is a mature bull, um, sort of. So if a five, six-year-old bull, you know, you can load him. You can load him 100 cows and he'll cover them. And, you know, where we live, um, it's very mountainous. And it's amazing at the bulls by the end of the um, season, they're not thin. But you, the muscle definition is unbelievable because they're running up and down, up and down. So by the end of a breeding season, those bulls are like super athletes, in my opinion. You know, they've done their job and they've been um, covering. You know, we get um, up to six, seven calves in a day from one bull. Um, it's, you know, when the stud, obviously that doesn't mean they've been served exactly on that day. But um, we've had it in the past and sort of four calves. So when you're doing your birth notices, you actually, like it shocks me to see that a bull can do that and, and they do it. It's, it's unbelievable. It, it, isn't it a funny thought to think uh, about uh, that uh, the, the bull is uh, getting getting fit, running up and down, doing hill sprints, uh, uh, you know, having fun with the ladies and, um, <laughs> and doing it 100. I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with other breeds in terms of the numbers, but um, yeah. I, I'm not, I haven't heard that that kind of ratio ever before. No, no other breeds, I'll talk to you about 25, 30 max um, per bull. So, I mean, these bulls are doing four times as much plus, if, if not more. And, um, you know, and, and that's just on my farms, which um, it's not flat ground. It's, it's up and down. And, you know, then you sort of wonder, but this bull, how's he coping? He's sort of from this cow to the next cow. Then he's up the mountain, then he's down, and, then, you know, and the water's down the bottom. You just don't know, you know, when does this bull rest? But they, and you know, the, I've sold bulls to farmers, um, even in the Karoo, where it's harsh. And when I sort of, we always phone a couple of months later to find out how the bull's doing. And they'll buy a three-year-old bull, put him in um, 50 cows, 60 cows, and then I ask them, well, how's the bull done? They say, in fact, the bull's gained weight and he got 100% conception. So, you know, it's um, that makes me feel good because, um, you know, with out interfering in the, the breed, they've just proven that, you know, they don't need man's interference to perform well. Yes, and 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 other breeds might. You're talking about the condition. Other breeds, um, the bulls actually lose weight and they lose condition because of the yeah. the stress of um of, of continually the demanding activity of reproduction. Um, so yeah, that that it's very stark that difference that you're you're describing, and it's um yeah, it's 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 very interesting. The you know what what we've also noticed um with like our bull selection. You know, we're very very strict on bulls, so. <laughs> We'll only keep probably about 5% of our um, bull calves as bulls. And the only reason for that is um, we only want the best to go out there. And what we do is after weaning, the bulls are put up high up in the mountain. It's it's very rough ground. 
and they left there just on a sort of a simple um, winter lick. Uh, they go through heavy snows, cold ice winds, hard um, felt, and then at the end of the winter, any bulls that have fallen to pieces, we uh, cull. So basically, you left with only the best. And um, I think over the years, um, that's one of the reasons why our bulls and that are adapting so well to the other breeders. And um, so, you know, there's a little bit of um, what we'll call man's interference there because, um, but if you think about it in, in over thousands of years, only the fittest survive. So, um, you know, the, uh, a bull, if you bring your bulls in and you pamper them, call it that, um, look after them, um, they all going to make it. But if you put them under harsh natural selection, only the best are going to make it. And um, so that's why I think the Ngunis have done so well. Yeah, great, great point, Clive. And, and I really want to emphasize this because what you described earlier in, earlier is that the Zulu people and the tribal people were having some um, influence on the selection of these animals, but not in a way that seems to have caused de a detrimental effect on, on the breed. And if we, if what I mean by that is if you look at the way people have bred pug dogs and the fact is that now their snouts are so short that they have upper respiratory, um, they have upper airway issues, they get obstructive sleep apnea. And, um, you know, there's all these, there's all these negative, um, these problems that have arisen from human specific selection. But what the Nguni has had is, is that gentle kind of selection through the Zulu people. And then what you're doing is essentially providing that very gentle um, select, selection, human selection pressure, but most of it, most of the time, it's nature. But you're just doing a little bit here and there to, you know, ensure that the best bulls are are, are reproduced. Yes. So, yeah, um, I, I I think that's important. Yeah, you know, and if you look at a Nguni compared to another breed, is um, you know, it's all the the natural things that over time that have made it what it is. If you look how long its tail is and flexible with a big brush for swatting flies. Um, you know, the other breeds, you get some breeds, they've got these short, thick tails, they can't swat a fly. And yeah, in, you know, in Africa, you have to have a breed that can swat its flies. If you look at their skins, um, you know, they if they're so sensitive, if a little insect lands on it, it, it quivers its skin. You know, so it's it's got the ability um, of all natural things that like you don't, like a normal person doesn't think about it. But when you're working with these cattle every day and for years you've been, there's um, things that you notice and, um, you know, it just shows how amazing nature is. Yeah, it's the most advanced technology. That's that's actually how I think about it. It is the most advanced technology um that 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 has been invented and um, that we couldn't come up with and um there there's all attempts to grow kind of lab based meat and and all this kind of hubristic um endeavors by by hum humans but you know nature has perfected it um as as we mentioned the the other point i wanted to really make um with regard to selective breeding is that this idea of low methane genetics and this this topic arose in 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 a group um, and basically there's there's a new impetus of selection pressure and this is coming from government and regulatory bodies who are concerned about methane emission from cattle and one of the ways that these um, that commodity producers are responding is looking into selectively breeding their cows to not burp and fart as much methane out and when I read that I thought that that is just an absolute recipe for um, you know, long-term degeneration of and mal selection of your breed. If you're deciding to choose one metric that um, is not relevant to the survivability of the cow, but because some bureaucrat and paper pusher, um, you know, is making that as their impetus, um, and then you're potentially moving an entire breed or entire herd towards an arbitrary metric, and um, that. At the expense of what? Um, because you, we, we can't see um, the trade-offs that that Mother Nature makes when when they're doing natural selection. So, um, yeah, do you have any do you have any comments on that? You know, my opinion is that's where we um, 
we are fortunate because we farming with a breed where we're running them naturally and um like i said in earlier is um our cattle is basically we run them we ranch them like wild game um some of our farms don't even have working facilities on them so when they um going to be worked they get brought home but we basically um it's it's nature um looks after them and they look after um the felt you know that's where i'm saying they it's it's everything's done naturally so the cattle browse graze um definitely the the meat's healthier you're not going to get that where you cooping cattle up in a small area like um feedlots and that's where all this burping and stuff is coming from it's not the natural um environment and that's where the indigenous indigenous breeds um you can do it with them they don't need um all that fancy food and stuff yeah yeah no great great points the the idea of pest resistance you mentioned they have a, a very sensitive skin and um if, if something lands on it the skin can ripple so they've got such fine yeah. control of their skin to kind of ripple and, and defend against something like fly but but ha- what are their defenses against various pests you know what we do is um we've got ticks and we got um asiatic african red water golsick and um you know when we tell people we've we haven't dipped our cattle for 18 years um you know a lot of people don't believe us but i've actually shown um other beef farmers that inguni is is, is super flexible so what you'll find is the ticks will be packing on the udders and they will literally turn their body around, lift their tail up in the air, and they can lick it at the back, um, where other breeds will never do that. They're not flexible enough. And then on their necks, you'll see them grooming each other. And that's why ingunis always stick together. Um, if you come to a camp, you'll see the herd. They're always in groups, and um, they they groom each other, so they lick and their tongues are very rough, so they're actually getting rid of most of the ticks themselves naturally. So when it becomes a irritation, you'll see the cows rubbing on on trees or whatever, and then they you'll see the grooming taking part. So um, yes, our cows get full of um, ticks and that, which is a big problem for other breeds. They're dipping, they're using chemicals and porons and all that. Our cattle don't. They don't even, you know, they're not coming into the um, working facilities for all that. So they're just staying out naturally. And then when it comes to parasites, um, they definitely have um, far more resistance than other cattle. Uh, what we have noticed with Nguni is in areas where it's very wet, um, you know, constantly wet, you will get... Um, sort of like conical fluke liver fluke affecting some but not um it's it's minor compared to other breeds so you know that's there again nature's uh, made them what they are and that's why we must just keep them as natural as we can and not interfere and try and um, change them just keep them natural Yes, and and there's an animal ethics um, aspect to this, which um, Jake Walkie helped me understand. Which is, if we're using an animal that doesn't have um, these these uh, attributes, and perhaps in an area that they shouldn't be, that animal's going to get sick. And the the corollary of a sick animal in a situation that it shouldn't be in is it gets drenches, it gets antibiotics, it gets all this veterinary care. So the solution isn't to have a vet on call and with with a big bag of medicines and all this chemical the solution is to use an animal that doesn't need the chemical in the first place and that's exactly what 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 you're describing clive with with the inguni animal so so i think that's just an you know added to the massive long list of of attributes of um of of these amazing these these amazing creatures and the other and another uh, facet to that is it means that we don't um need to uh, we don't i guess influence residue or, or leave residue on the meat in, in, in terms of animals that we're going to eat. Because, you know, I think that is an underappreciated um, issue, which is um, contamination of, of the final product in 
commodity feedlot fed beef and um you know the 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 from a health point of view and the obviously my listeners will know that i i advocate for a carnival diet for people who are very sick it seems like the fully grass-fed beef is the necessary part of that healing protocol um for the most sick people some can tolerate any kind of beef but the sickest seem to need the fully grass-fed that has had no kind of chemical input so um i i think that's another reason is that the inguni is a tool that allows us to to, to raise chemical free beef yeah um and and talk again about the meat quality because you, you touched on that really briefly you know the meat um it's a healthy meat um you know so I mean, there's, there's Nguni meat has got good marbling. It's got, you know, the fats, um, or it's more a yellow fat, um, like a more oily fat. So all the people I know prefer the yellow fat, but, um, cause there's nothing worse when you're eating fat, um, that's not natural, like out of a feedlot something and the, the, the fat sticking to your palate. It's that white, um, fat, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's not for me. I, you know, everyone's got their own personal preference, but I just prefer the natural beef. Um, there's no hormones. There's no, um, it's, you know, like we don't um, dip. We don't do any of that. So our meat is um, organic, basically natural meat. Yeah, yeah, fa- fantastic. So, so you, I guess um, you give us such a good overview of the of the breed uh, as as a whole. And and maybe we can talk a bit a bit now about um, again your your specific kind of operation. So you you mentioned this idea of of it, and it sounds like you're running almost like a Nguni uh, Jurassic Park. You just uh, you just let them go. <laughs> you you bring them back when you need them. Um. So so what 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 else is kind of unique to your your operation and your property that that you you do with your um, operation. You see, what we've done um, with our grazing patterns is, you know, obviously with running a stud, we can't keep um, massive uh, cows in one herd because, you know, with a multi-sire, um, you know, if you've got too many bulls in a confined area, because our farms are camped, um, we we try and not make the camps too small, but you also don't want them too big for um, our grazing uh, management. We sort of do a rotational grazing so um, the animals are in the area for a specific time um, so we yeah we begin to watching our felt um, that we don't overgraze or even undergraze um, you know the and it's it's actually amazing um, the laugh that you get in your felt with the way we're farming now so what we'll do is um, in the breeding season, our herds are about a hundred cows um, in the herd, close to a hundred, and they sort of rotated um, depending on the camp size. But probably they're in a camp for about five days, and then they move to another camp. And what we've um, found by doing that is your good grass species. Um, they're taking sort of about thirty to forty percent of it off. And that actually stimulates it. And then your more unpalatable grasses, um, they don't eat it. So that grass actually starts dying off, um, you know, over time. Obviously, everything takes time, but it's, um, we've been doing it for years now and we've seen a massive, um, improvement. And we don't believe in any burning of any felt whatsoever. Um, so our humus buildup in our felt is, is, um, it's excellent. The laugh when you go in uh, early mornings, you'll see it's full of spider uh, webs, which help with um, tick control, everything. It's all natural stuff that, you know, we practice. And then when the bulls come out, we lump our cows into bigger herds. And then what we call the hoof action and, um, you know, sort of rotational grazing and the dunging. So they'll dung and urine and areas and then move and then that gets time to recover and our soils are getting more and more fertile and our better grasses um, are getting more and more and our sort of the more unpalatable grasses are getting less so in winter when it's um, not the growing season 
those cows will actually eat that um, unpalatable grasses down into the ground. But um, in summer, when it's seeding and that, they, um, you know, the, it, it sort of dies off more where the one that's being, it's like almost when you mow your lawn. Um, in summer, if you mow it, it'll get thicker and thicker and just grow faster and faster. It's the same as a felt. So your better grasses, um, they get stimulated and actually multiply. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Did is this, um, or was your father? Did he implement these policies initially, or did you bring these in? Yes, you know, my dad's always um, been someone that farms with nature, and um, you know, like he always tells us, he's made lots of mistakes in the past. Um, you know, we need to, we don't need to do the same mistakes. We must, um, and we've like basically grown up because our farm, my brother's also part of the farming. And um, so we, um, we've just spent, you know, days and hours and basically just grown up amongst our cattle. And um, he's always taught us to observe the felt and, and um, you know, sort of, if, they, if you see a, a problem, um, fix it, you know. So like in some places you'll get, uh, when you get a big storm, um, you know, you might get a landslide and a bit of soil washing, uh, then we'll plant grass immediately and try and stop it you know and, and just preserve our ground so you know if your if your grass and your farms aren't um, looked after you know it's and you're going backwards everything's going to just suffer so if we can sort of um, improve our felt as we go um, our cattle will just do better yes and and i, I think there was a, a famous zimbabwean cattle um, farmer who said that most of Africa is uh, over overgrazed but understocked, um, implying that um, these types of intensive uh, uh, techniques are, are are what's needed to kind of help help the grass thrive. Is, yeah. is there? Um, has, have you had contact or um, are familiar with obviously with Alan Savory in in terms of these your, your program? Yes, you know that they um, they farm in a different um, sort of area than us, so it's. Um, you know, they they sort of, I think he's up uh, Freiburg area, those areas, if I'm not um, mistaken. So, or where, where is he from? I've, you know, I've heard of him, but um, his technique is similar to ours, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, great stuff. Um, so talk, talk to us maybe about the the bulls that you have sold recently. And, and there was one, I believe, um, in 2020, that set a record, um, and then this year, quite recently, you've just set um, a, a, another record. So, t talk to us about um, these bulls. Yeah, you know, they're out of um, because you know my dad was. I think um, he's probably the oldest um, stud uh, breeder. You know, so basically, um, he had this vision of um, these Nguni cattle, and he's always been. Um, very strict on selection. So, um, and all his selection is under natural selection. There's no um, feeding the cattle and, and trying to uh, find the animal that's outperforming the others on growth and all that. We, you know, we're not interested in that. We want animals that maintain their condition on natural felt and um, produce on natural felt. That's what we after. So I think, um, with that in mind, over years we've um, bred a, a type of Nguni cattle that um, is like a no-fuss animal that can adapt virtually anywhere. We've sold animals all over the country and um, we you know, get very positive feedback on how they've done and performed and produced on you know, those areas. And some of these, um, like the first bull that you spoke of, 1258, um, he was sort of bred out of um his mother was one of our old bloodlines uh in and then the father was from a Dupree stud which was also an old stud um out of some of their best best, best bloodlines so um basically it was the two bloodlines combined and um we used that bull heavily he's one of the bulls that was covering 90 cattle in three months with no problem 
And um, what we found with his progeny is um, under our harsh conditions, they kept their condition uh, naturally through the cold, harsh winters better than some other bloodlines, um, which made them, when it came to spring, they were in good condition, uh, better than some of the others. Therefore, when the bulls went in, they were taking bull quicker um, with you know no interference. So it's not like we pampered them or anything it just naturally so yeah and his mother i think had had um 13 calves at the time and um you know a super cow she had bred other bulls which were sold as bulls the daughters were mostly retained in our herd um we had used sons in our herd um out of that specific cow so that um breeders from visiting on the farm saw his progeny and what they were doing um, therefore, I think that's why, you know, his price was, um, you know, it was a very good price and we were just grateful. And then this bull now, um, it's a s similar story where um, his father was a bull that we bought in from Pat Hobbs, which was out of some of his um, best lines, um, three of his top lines. And the bull bred very well for us. Um, and the son of his um, was the same we put him to 90 cows got 87 pregnant um, you know and he's a bull when you see him in the cows in the middle of the breeding season it looks like he hasn't even worked he's just round and fat and solid and you know the muscle definitions like unreal in his shoulders and and back muscles um it's like a like a bodybuilder almost um but he, yeah, he just covered them, you know, easily. And um, his mother was a cow um, that gave us 12 calves, uh, of which every calf passed um, screening inspection done by inspectors. We currently using another son of that same cow. He's um, a year younger. So, you know, it's just bloodlines that have worked. And um, basically, when the breeders come to the farm, I think those bulls, um, sisters brothers and progeny uh caught their eye and um you know that's why we had some breeders that actually uh, joined groups um to try and buy the bull but he's the, this last bull he's been bought by oliver radford from um, bloemfontein area great thanks thanks for that summary and what is the state of nguni in in africa because i've i've talked to some who've mentioned that there's there's a bit of dilution occurring in, in certain areas with, with, you know, Brahman, with other kind of cattle breeds and, and others have said, um, you know, particularly the cattle from the Makatini flat to remain some of the most pure. So talk, talk to me about the breed as a whole um, in, in, in Africa. Yeah. The problem is with all the indigenous breeds, um, you know, the, like what, you know, so, some of the people are saying, you know, bigger is better. And unfortunately, some of the bigger bulls have been introduced into a lot of the um, sort of rural areas. And um, the cross, you know, with a hybrid vigor, you're getting a sort of a bigger calf. And um, for that first generation, you know, it might look impressive. But the problem is then that um, cross animal is never going to perform like the pure animal. So... You know, some of them, they are crossing them, but we've had a lot of uh, people saying that they want to go back to their old roots because their cattle, they used to have um, far more death. Ugh, there's far more deaths now. Um, they're dipping more. Um, their cows aren't calving regularly because they're too big framed for the harsh conditions um, and they can't afford the licks. Um, so, you know, the cows aren't performing as well as what they used to um, perform. And we also, um, I do Nguni goats as well as Nguni cattle. And um, so we've preserved them. And, you know, I've had quite a few Zulu chaps contact me and um, they actually, you know, say thank you for, um, you know, like preserving our cattle because in our homelands, there are very few left. They um, and they're trying to, in some areas, I know in the Tugela Ferry area, there's a group of goat farmers that have contacted me and um, 
they're buying rams and that from me because they want to get their goats back to what they were um, purely because of the diseases, um, you know, tick-borne diseases and that and um, production. Like I said earlier, you know, if you take, um, you know, the, the production per hectare, there's nothing better than those um, small, medium-framed animals that are producing every year. Um, you know, and there's far less far less deaths um, with the indigenous animals. Amazing! It sounds like the the Nandi and Guni stud. It's it's not only the Jurassic Park, but it's also the uh, the conservation park uh, park as well. No, uh, that... Yeah, you know, it's just um, I think with us um, because we like we love nature, so you know we spend probably. 90% of the day outdoors um, and uh, you know we just my dad's taught us to like observe everything so from bird life to cattle to goats to the grass everything we just try and preserve it as natural as we can and um, you know we always say um, you know with humans um, a lot of damage caused is by humans you know just not understanding nature um so if we can all just work together and, and um you know work with nature not against it yeah that that i that i very much uh, echo echo those those claims those uh statements the the way i got interested in nguni was because i met um i went to a farmer's market and tasted some nguni meat that was being raised um on the sunshine coast in queensland and um, and the reason why that that the nguni were able to get to australia was because certain, a couple of breeders um br- flushed their their embryos in africa um and and emigrated to to australia um and we're then able to um, basically repopulate Nguni here. So it, it's uh, very exciting to see um, that that it was able to take hold. Are you? Um, do you have any kind of thoughts about Nguni in in terms of internationally and and kind of expanding to other countries? You know, it's um, especially like Australia is very similar to South Africa. You know, other areas um, where you're sort of it's. Um, you know, extensive farming, um, should I call it, like out um, your rougher areas, you know, there's there's nothing that will compare with Nguni. And um, the thing is just to get a farmer to um, basically start farming Ngunis. Once you, once you start farming with them, it's, become, it's, it's actually a pleasure farming. You know, I always listen to these other farmers with other, um, yeah, and they're complaining about the feed bills, um, they're complaining about, um, you know, things where within Gunis, um, you know, I just, I just keep quiet and, um, you know, enjoy the, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure farming with them. Yeah. And, and it's funny cause I like to, obviously this is a mostly a health podcast and I, and I draw analogies to human medicine and I've, I've, I often describe the, the similarities between, um, using lifestyle medicine with low carbon carnivore diets, um, and how doctors that I've talked to finally find like regain their their passion and their love of medicine because they're actually healing people again, and they're they're, they're de prescribing medications and they're seeing people thrive. And it's just a, it's it's funny and amazing to hear you describe that same um, feeling when you when you talk about raising in Goonie cattle because it sounds like the same energy of finding joy in in the process um using these cattle because you don't have to dip them you don't have to spend all this money on 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 chemical inputs so it's uh it's it's amazing how that these analogies exist in farming and health and medicine and food so it's uh yeah it's it's very elegant yeah, um, you know and we in the, a better you know, with the way farming's Turn going, on. it's becoming, um, you know, very expensive um, in this country, farming with input costs. And, um, you know, I just see a, a big uh, future for our breed. Um, you know, all the indigenous breeds, not just the Nguni. Um, you know, if you can have an animal producing with low input, um, no fuss, you know, it's definitely the future. Yes. And and what what's your vision for your 
for your operation debt for Nandi and Goonies? What 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 are you where are you guys going and what would you like to see um in the future? You know, I just um yeah, we just basically we're so passionate about the cattle, you know, it's um they basically like the family. It's not a you know, we see it as um you know, we've all grown up with them. They've uh, put us all through school. Um, you know, they've fed us. They've um, basically they've looked after us, and and um, we've bought on farms. We've grown. Um, you know, and it's all thanks to the Nguni breed. Um, you know, we where we farmed it's it's, it's rough country, and uh, it's not easy farming. But with Nguni, it's it you know it's turned out to be we love it, and it's it's just our passion and. Um, like I said, the cattle are looking after us. It's not like we um sort of pampering looking after them. They they do everything for us and in, in return we get the joy and the pleasure out of it. Um you know, what more can one want than that? Yeah, fantastic. Well well Clive, uh, do you have any um I guess comments or thoughts that you want to share with, with the listeners before we uh, wrap this up? You know, I would just say, like, if there are farmers out there, even if you you don't live on your farm and you're wanting an animal that can sort of, um, you know, if you've got ground and you want to try a breed, there's, you know, try the Nguni because um, they, they'll they surprise you. You know, they'll they'll produce where you, with minimal input. And um, once you start breeding with the Nguni, it's, it's something that your passion will just grow. Um, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a people's cattle, and um, the connection you build between them is it's well, and it's not just from your side. The cattle, you can see they, um, you know, they, they love people. So um, yeah, I'd recommend if you got a chance to farm with them, go for it. Great, fantastic advice. Where can people? find you and get in contact with you if they're interested in in following what you're doing you know well we um basically if they sort of google just nandi and goonies um you know there's a lot of we've had articles and write-ups on our stud and um i think our contact numbers and that will be there or um you know if anyone wants to get into contact with us they can contact the nguni society and they'll get our information from them. Okay, great. Well, uh, and I, I can include some of those links in the in the show notes below. So thanks, Clive. It was a very, very interesting and fascinating chat. So uh, I really appreciate you uh, your your time. No, thank you very much.